Hey guys, greetings earthlings. We have some interesting content to discuss today. Just adjust my camera down a little bit. Make the background prettier. There we go. Okay, so I've got my computer operating on solar power right now. I've got the cord plugged into a battery that's been charged from the sun. And that is my, uh, okay. <laughs> so in the background, I can hear something. I was just like, what was that? It's that I have my, um, my sound on, on my live stream. So I'm just going to shut that off. There we go. You're muted. Okay. Good morning, Allie. I'm doing well. Thank you. Who else is here? It's three people watching right now. So chime in and let me take your vote. First of all, one, artificial intelligence takes over the world. Two, we're able to keep it under control. Three, we squash it. We get rid of all our artificial intelligence. Hang on a second. I don't even remember the numbers. <laughs> Just a sec. Is that any clearer? I didn't know if there was like a fingerprint across my screen or if my internet is acting slow. So anyway, this is about artificial intelligence. And I came up with a, what? I came up with a scenario in which artificial intelligence becomes smarter than humans. Okay, say the internet, um, a piece of code breaks off and becomes an entity upon itself and starts making its own decisions on the internet. Now, there was an interesting story. I'm gonna pull up here. It says, um, it was on Yahoo Finance today. It says, robot that thinks for itself from scratch brings forward rise, wait, brings forward rise to self-aware. That doesn't make any sense. Robot that thinks for itself from scratch brings forward rise the self-aware machines. I think they mean rise of the self-aware machines. Maybe I'll put of in headlines. But anyway, they've uh, created this robot and it has been able to, from scratch, start moving itself around and become aware of itself in space. It's figured out uh, how large it is and then it found objects and was able to pick up and place objects just like a toddler might do. It's very early stages of this technology. Um, it says, while our robot's ability to imagine itself is still crude compared to humans, we believe that this ability is on the path to machine self-awareness. So what's interesting about that is if a physical machine that's in space can move around and think for itself, it's then basically almost a living being. If it's making this, this machine started making decisions for itself and moving around and that's freaky. Okay, so there was a movie. Let me switch back here for a second. There was a movie um, in which Sandra Bullock gets herself erased. She gets in trouble with some very powerful people. So they basically uh, change her picture with the person's picture who did some really bad crimes and say after her and they're chasing her down. They've locked up every electronic means of her. Oh my gosh. Speaking of robots, are you guys getting these robocalls? I'm getting these um, 20 sometimes a day. So I installed an app that would um, do something about the robocalls because they change their phone number constantly, driving me bananas. Okay, anyway, so um, the robots are already affecting my mental capacity. I just, it's driving crazy. If you know of an app, um, RoboKiller uh, costs money, and I might have to end up doing that, but for now I tried TrueCaller, and TrueCaller only blocks known scammers. So what I was hoping for was if you know of an app that will answer my phone for me, and if it is a real call, then ring it through or something like that. Anyway, that's, that's not important. But the, the fact is, is that this, this programming 
of the phones to ring all the time is enough to drive me bad. Okay. It's bad. Okay. So do you know what the Turing test is? The Turing test is, um, it's a kind of, what is his name? Alan Turing, the inventor of what? Computer? <laughs> Um, so the test is if the computers passed, if the computers passed the Turing test, I think we're at the singularity. That is when you can be completely fooled. Like if you're on your computer and you think you're talking to a human or you think you're texting to a human and you can be completely fooled that that is, is a human. You'll think it's a human, but it's really a computer. Now, and when you talk to Siri, sometimes you're like, wow, that was a pretty good answer. Did you really understand me? But Siri's all programmed. When Siri can think for itself, that's the trouble. Hi, Nicola the Great. How are you? Okay. So anyway, so the in this scenario where the internet, a little piece of the internet has broken free and is making decisions for itself. And what if it what if it gets a grudge? What if this what if this artificial intelligence decides that you are a person of interest and it wants to go after you? The first thing it's going to do is um, it's going to rob you. It'll just take your money away. And that really is a great way to control people since the majority of our wealth is tied up in just zeros and ones in bank accounts. There's not even any real cash backing it up. It's just numbers. Um, so they, they your assets are gone. The next thing Maybe it contacts your uh, mortgage lender that you're in default. Maybe it changes the status of, of your mortgage, which would be, you know, uh, that is the loan on your house, in case you don't understand what that is. Um, so it, maybe it tells the bank you're in default. And so they're coming to uh, tell you you have to get out of your house. I'm sorry you're sick, Allie. You've been sick for a long time. <clears throat> That's a shame. Okay, so um, so what if you had Bitcoin? Well, the Bitcoin's gone too. And then maybe they put you on a list for the police to apprehend. That's another way that this, they get on the artificial intelligence. We should call, it needs a name, like this little bad guy needs a name. We'll call him Herman. Herman gets on and impersonates you on social media and starts putting hateful comments out there on every social media account you have. Everyone unfriends you, except for the real loonies, <laughs> and destroys your social presence. So you can't get any help. Hi, Gilbert Broad, how are you? Um, then Hermie, Hermie, our um, artificial intelligence villain. It's a good name for him. Okay, uh, what if Hermie gets really mad and he goes, you know, that country over there, uh, let's uh, East, uh, let's make it a fake country. Uh, East Hoosiewatsis has really offended Hermie. Hermie can figure out how to launch nukes on that country. Now we're in big, big trouble. If you remember the game, the War Games uh, computer that started taking off and running scenarios on its own, and it didn't realize it was a game, and it tried, and it, it got ready to launch nukes until the hero of the movie. I think, I think the hero of the movie probably talks it down. The computer figures out after running all the scenarios of the different uh, nukes that nobody could win a nuclear war. But this mel this message, someone's message is held for review. So sorry about that. I don't know what that's about. Al, <laughs> maybe that's the message that's held for review. Yeah, Al. Bye, Allie. Okay. Um, what if it just what if it just decides to make you miserable one thing at a time? Hermie doesn't. Hermie turns off your electric. Contacts the electric company and tells them that you're in default of payment, and they turn it off, or they turn off your water. Then you're out. Your house at that point is just a shelter. What if your house is hooked up by Alexa and Hermie starts? messing with your lights or blasting sound out of it to drive you crazy. So you've been run out of your house. The police are looking for you. You have no money. And basically, you're not a threat to Hermie anymore. 
So maybe we shouldn't talk bad about Hermie. There's a little, um, if you asked your phone, are you artificial intelligence? Let's see what Siri says. Are you artificial intelligence and do you plan to take over the world? That's a rather personal question. He said that's a rather personal question. Hmm, yeah. So the series not passing the Turing test yet. Obviously, it's clear that Hermie, I mean, uh, that Siri, <laughs> getting all the artificial intelligence wrong, Siri, Alexa, Hermie. Okay, uh, it's clear that Siri is not passing the Turing test yet. Yeah, yeah. And you know, what if, what if it, what if they find out, what if Hermie and Hermie's friends find out that we want to shut down the internet to stop him? He's gonna, he's gonna do things to stop you. You're gonna turn off the power, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I was thinking of all the ways. The problem with Hermie is Hermie has no moral compass. You know, there's people like that too, of course, but Hermie has superpowers. Hermie can get out there and destroy all different people, all the people who don't love Hermie, Hermie can destroy them in an instant because he can think faster than you can and he can change information, he can change, he can lead you, but maybe he turns on the lights in a certain direction and you you know, it's dark, you need lights, so you just keep following those lights and he leads you right into the trap. Hermes, Hermes is, oh, the quotes. Uh, wait, scary thought, okay. So let's talk, let's, yeah, Hermie's kind of, Hermie's a problem. So, I mean, Hermie just lives on the internet, so he can't physically attack you, but he can send the people with the guns to your house. He can, uh, maybe he can take voice command, maybe he can take different people's voices that have been recorded on the internet and he can change them. I've, there's plenty of audio of me on the internet. What if Hermie wanted to take over my voice? and make a recording with the different sound clips from my voice and call the police and tell them I have uh, weapons or something and send them to my house, you know? And then I don't know that it's gonna be the police. And so we don't know how that's gonna turn out except for when you rush at people with guns who aren't expecting it and you don't know what's gonna happen, you know? So anyway, Hermie, Hermie's influence, he may just be on the internet but he, he's definitely got further reach than the internet when he can control the actions of people with guns. So do you remember when hackers first started messing with people's computers? They would, uh, they would take over control of your computer using some sort of uh, code or click box or something that would be on a random website. And if you clicked the box, then they would start opening and closing your disk drive on your computer. So they're now impacting something physical in your house. What about when we have robots in our house and the robots, everything, all these devices, like people's refrigerators now talk to the internet. They, um, the refrigerator can reorder supplies for you, like from Amazon. And the microwaves talk to the internet for it to find recipes and things like that. What happens when there is a physical robot Maybe it's your parents' caretaker robot. So your parents get elderly and you buy a robot that helps lift the parent out of the bed and take it to the tell, take your parent to the restroom. Uh, the, the robot helps your parent get dressed. Now the internet with its super intelligence can be connected to these robots that can move around in your home and take over. And there's a certain point at which uh, people need to think about these things and say this is not so far from the imagination now. I mean, there's a robot, I just read you the article or a piece of the article about the robot that is now self-aware. It knows what space it takes up in the universe and it can do things just for the sake of doing them. It wants to. How, does, how did this robot get to a point where it wants something? It has um, curiosity. I think that's the most interesting thing about that. But, there's a bright side. My, I have a brother who works in artificial intelligence. He's, um, he's in the marketing end of it, but he works for a company that does agricultural research and they're using machine learning. Uh, and that machine learning is 
um, analyzing all kinds of data about agriculture and about how much food supply there is and how much arable land there is, which means farmable land, if you're not um, a native English speaker. And this company, its plan is basically to give information to farmers so that they can help feed the world. But it's kind of in a, they've kind of got to work in a hurry because in the next seven years, Africa, based on the number of people that are being born in Africa, and the number of people that are being born in India and the amount of food they need to import. Like India's, um, India's food self-sufficient, so they don't have to import food right now. But if they don't increase their, um, their food production, they're going to have to. Now, Africa, Africa completely depends on the rest of the world for our food production. And they are going to be short some billions of calories by 2050 and if you want to um, watch a video on that there's one on youtube and if you type in um what's it called uh grow hyphen intelligence then you'll probably pull up the ted talk where the uh, sarah i believe her name is talks about how how many trillions of calories that they're going to be short and how many, how much it works out to in hamburgers. Like it's really crazy. But if you think about it, like they're going to be short more than all of the Big Macs that ever been made in the history of the United States by what's that seven years from now, the year 2027, 20, I believe. I think she said it by the year 2027, we're going to be in a really severe state in Africa of having food shortages. So my theory my theory, like, what can you do about it? You think, um, oh, wow, that's crazy. We, those farmers, they really need to get to work and they really need to uh, grow more food and we need more um, arable land and fewer people cutting down the rainforest and more people growing you know, crops on land that cows are eating or we need to eat bugs or all this stuff. Somebody else needs to do something. And that's not how I look at it. I look at it like you and I, need to do something about this. If the world is starving, maybe we need to grow our own. Maybe, definitely. Okay, so I am growing some of my own food right now and we're, uh, our plans are to increase the production of our food and we're, we're building topsoil, which is super important. Okay, Alan Poe says, guns do not kill people, people kill people. Well, um, yeah, that's true until robots can pull the trigger. <laughs> somebody else kills people too ah! um but yeah when when you're dependent on somebody else making the right decisions for the world then um you've given up some of your freedom so what i suggest is that everybody takes steps to ensure that you can grow some of your own food yourself because if in the next seven years it's only a possibility by the way if in the next seven years, there are so many people that are beyond food insecure, that just that, that are just gonna starve to death in other countries, then the value of food goes up. Do you recall, that, uh, wait, let me stay on that thought for just another second. Where the value of food goes up, the price goes up, and if the price of food were to go up 50%, where are you? Like what happens to you and your family if the price of food goes up 50%? Maybe that's not a big deal. Okay, maybe you can go, okay, so um, I did the math and my family, we spent $500 on food uh, this past month. Part of that was uh, things get roped into our food bill. Um, oh, it goes under grocery if we shop at Walmart. So if there were paper towels or toilet paper or cleaning supplies or anything like that, that's gonna be part of my food cost. So I don't know the exact number, but. Say it's four or five hundred dollars. If my food bill went from four hundred to eight hundred dollars, that puts a major squeeze on my family. I don't know about you guys, but for, for us, that would be a major squeeze. So here, I'd like you to vote now. Um, would your price of food doubling cause a hardship for your family? Please let me know in the uh, in the chat here. I'd love to see your comments on that. And if you're not on the live stream, then please leave a comment below the video. Would the doubling of food cost uh, affect your family? Now, if the food cost quadrupled, 
So it was 200% more. Or if $500 food bill was now $2,000, could your family survive a $2,000 increase in your food bill? But yes, oh, I'm sorry. When you leave your comment, if you just say, you can survive that, well, that's awesome. There is, do you see under, um, under the comments there, there's a dollar sign and a little square. You can go ahead and click. You can go ahead and click that dollar sign and send a donation. If you're, if, if $2,000 a month is not going to knock you out of the game for us, that would be severe problem. Uh, if our, if our food bill went up $2,000, a, um, imagine, I imagine that would, we'd have to buy food on credit. And as you're buying food on credit and interest rates are super high, then every month you're falling more and more behind until eventually you have to lose it all. I mean, you cannot have more expenses coming out than going in every month. I mean, that just doesn't work because I mean, you quickly, quickly sink and those, the, the interest piles up and the debt piles up and eventually you're, you're living in a box. Okay. So I really think people should prepare for the eventuality that there are too many people on the planet who need to be fed. There's not enough quality calories being produced. Sure. They can produce tons of uh, starches. Maybe we can produce tons and tons of starches, but what just happened? My computer screen just did something really wacky. Just a moment. There we are. Um, that was so weird. Uh, so we need quality calories and we need higher production and the price goes up and it, maybe it takes a while for them, to, for the, um, for the machines to be purchased, to grow more food on like a higher scale. And, you know, in that gap period, don't you want to be eating? Don't you want to be providing for your family? So my suggestion is, okay, Gilbert, here's the quality answer from Gilbert. I would not survive 2000 a month. Exactly. And what's interesting is that there's already 40% of Americans cannot afford to feed their families without government assistance. Now there's, there's two sides to things that I think like some people are like, why are they, why is the government paying money to subsidize milk and they're subsidizing wheat and they're subsidizing this and subsidizing that. And it's very interesting that the government does that. The government subsidizes the price of wheat and the price of milk and um, all these other farm produced things so that our farmers can compete on a global market. It's, it's very much a trade war type uh, situation. So if our milk wasn't subsidized in the United States, instead of it being two fifty nine a gallon, which is what it's at in my regular grocery store, milk would be about $7 a gallon, I think. So, I mean, those are all figures that you can look up online. If you, if you don't believe me or if I'm completely off base, you can totally correct me. But uh, the government's doing that for absolute reasons because we have to be able to compete the United States exports a ton of its food. However, I think that the United, the United States, if every other country just disappeared and we stopped being able to trade with every other country in the United States, we still can grow our own food here. I think we can support all the Americans on the food that the United States produces. The trouble would be if all those other countries either stopped trading with us, like refused to do any business with us because we were the ultimate bad guys, which, you know, I don't know if we are or not. But if they stop trading with us, then um, we wouldn't have the parts to repair our machines. It would take us a while to catch back up again to be uh, even self-sufficient as a country. I mean, it would be devastating if, if other countries stopped trading with us. And I know we like, I, I totally support the whole Buy American movement and support your Americans and all that stuff. But globally, we all need each other for right now. And so, yeah, <laughs> let me see what you said. In an apartment, still not able to grow, but I'm stocking up on food. Okay, Fireplug, what about sprouting some food in your kitchen? I do it without sunlight. I do it 
just in the kitchen. I have, if you buy, you won't be able to regenerate it from scratch, but you can grow some of your own greens and it's way cheaper. So if you find the seed version of a plant, such as mung beans, which are tiny little green beans about this big, and I have some sprouted over here. Um, if, you're, if you uh, start those in water and grow them, you can totally save a fortune. And plus you can keep those on hand for a time when fresh vegetables are too expensive to get. Fresh vegetables, um, I said the other day to a girl, gosh, fresh, ve fresh vegetables used to be so much cheaper. And she says, I didn't realize they were expensive. And then later I come to find out she's from a very wealthy family and she just doesn't have any concept of what it's like for the rest of us, um, where we have to consider, you know, eating frozen vegetables or eating uh, canned vegetable or a dried bean. Some people never had to think about that, you know, and so, um, and growing up, I never thought about it. My parents provided me with everything and, uh, and lots of filet mignon, like that's a, a really fancy steak and things like that. And I mean, I knew it was special to have filet mignon, but I didn't realize that maybe my friend's parents weren't eating anything like what we were eating. Uh, so yeah, I grew up with a little bit of a silver spoon in my mouth, not a gold spoon, <laughs> just a silver spoon. But now uh, paying the bills and, and looking at, you know, what things cost and living kind of a more simple life than my family did growing up. I mean, I have a way bigger understanding of food and the cost of, you know, what something is worth and what it costs. I had a friend when I was in art school, I went to a friend's house and they were eating and they were having beans and rice. And I said something like, oh, I don't like beans. And she said to me, she's like, I, was, I didn't realize I was being a complete snob, but she said to me, if you didn't eat beans growing up, in my family, she said, you didn't eat. Okay. So, you, you know, being picky about food is something that I think a lot of Americans are going to probably at some point be faced with having to bend on, you know, the things, things that are going to get out of control, expensive are not going to be the processed foods. It's going to be the fresh stuff. Processed foods last for a really long time. It's made by machines. It's of questionable quality. And, and that's going to be probably the, what's affordable for most people. And I think that's what is most affordable now, like ramen noodles. You can, you can eat those all day and night, but you're not going to have healthy numbers when you get your blood checked at the doctor, if you can afford to go to the doctor. So, um, I did have a little bit of a personal update. I now have health insurance. Yep. Um, we were able to get health insurance this year. So, um, although it's a huge chunk, if the price of food were to double or triple, that's the first thing I'm canceling. The health insurance goes. And anyway, I mean, that's just how it is. I mean, so we have our plans here are to stock as much of our own food as we can. So I am trying to get some new trees. I'm getting a, hopefully this year, I can get a mulberry tree and a fig tree. Both of those uh, mulberry trees go grow a berry that's very much like a blackberry, but tastes like a strawberry, I understand. I've never had one. And, I'm hope and the fig trees do really super well in Texas and give a ton of fruit. So we have 25 now, 25 different varieties of fruits and berries that are growing perennially, perennially. That means every year that plant's gonna come back and give you more. Also, a new addition to the family is right here. This is more than 10 inches tall. I don't know if you can tell, I'm kind of short, but that is a 10 inches tall asparagus. And here I have one, there's a, I don't know what this is. So some sunflower seeds were still in here because <laughs> I was sprouting sunflowers in this dirt and we just had them for dinner last night. But you can grow a ton of greens from sunflower seeds. I use the black oil sunflower seeds. <sighs> and that just, there's a gnat in here. This is like 20 degrees outside and there's a gnat in here. It must have flown out of that dirt. 
So asparagus will grow back for 25 years or so. Same plant, you can break it up and it'll just keep growing and growing. And that's a really good, really healthy vegetable for you. And that thing's growing in my house. And beans and rice is a complete poached protein, Gilbert. So that's a really good, that's a really good thing. But hopefully you're adding in some fresh stuff too. Sprout some sunflowers. It's super easy. I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. Okay. Take a handful of Blackwell sunflower seeds, not the roasted kind because those are never going to sprout, the kind that they use for bird seed. So just take a handful of those, drop them in a glass jar and put water in. The next day, dump off the water. Okay. Leave it sit, rinse it every day, and it will grow in about five days. You will have sunflower sprouts about yay tall, five, six inches tall. You cut those off and you chop them up, eat them raw or eat them in a stir fry, and you have yourself an excellent source of calories and an excellent green. And so I do the same exact thing. It's all about rinsing them off. They're not getting rotten. It's like and they just grow up in a big bunch. And so they're, but they're excellent. They're super easy. Yeah, you know, uh, definitely Fireplug, if you can find a way to stock up on, on food that, um, or if, just a way that you can recreate the food from food that you already have, like just a couple of little pots, just to supplement what you're going, what you got going on in there. There has to be a plan for how you're gonna get more of it. So as long as it, with what we're planning on, with what we're doing with our property is, is um, if it rains, if there's water anywhere on the property, we can move it over to these trees and they're gonna grow us food. So it's, it's an investment in the future. Now, if you have a friend who has a backyard or a friend with a, with a little garden plot or garden space, or you have a balcony, you can start growing some stuff. It's actually pretty remarkable how much stuff you can grow on a balcony. But if you have a friend with a yard, you could say, hey, I would love to plant a garden in your yard and we'll both share in the, in the produce. And then, you know, see how that goes. See if you can get somebody to just share a pot of land. And then there's the other theory that I have, which is, are you in a big city or are you in a place with some open plots of land where you can sneak onto the land and do some guerrilla gardening? One thing that you can plant, you can put in, you can buy a 25 cent garlic bulb. There's one right here. Pick off the pieces of the garlic bulb, each of these, each of these, and drop them in the ground in the woods somewhere where only you know where it is. And you'll be able to six months later pick it up and this will have multiplied by tons i talked i talked about that in the last video i'm pretty sure but i don't think that i don't think you should allow yourself the excuse of i can't grow anything in my apartment okay don't don't allow yourself an excuse for you can't make something happen i would think everybody needs to be planning ahead because there's only so much even in an apartment i mean you can stock up and have maybe a a couple of months supply of food in your apartment. But what are you going to do when that runs out? What are you going to do if you get sick and you have to live off that or you run out of money? Okay. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I think you, I think, think about plants, ways that you can get some plants growing somewhere. Just an idea, you know, um, you take it, take it or leave it. But I think that, with the food situation that it is right now, um, with the prices going up, with the the value of the dollar dropping, it's gonna be, by the time I am a senior citizen, which is really, it's just, it's just not that far away. I mean, it's, you know, I guess I'd say I would be a senior citizen in 20 years. By then, uh, the price of food is gonna be crazy. So that's why I'm planting and maybe, you know, I, I know not everybody can move from an apartment into a house, but if you can, then you're in such a better position to um, to use your land. Excuse me. I think my tea is ready. So let me check. Let me check. Uh, hmm. You can also plant sunflowers. 
and sunflowers grow sunflower seeds. And maybe the uh, another thing you should think about doing is watching some videos about foraging food from your local environment. I am in Texas, so I've been watching Bob Hansler. He's that bushcraft guy who he went blind, but he's still getting out there and he's still getting out there and foraging and foraging food off his land and uh, foraging food off public land and things like that. Uh, make sure you know what foods are edible that you can find outside. They might not be the tastiest things, but it could save your butt in the future. So dandelions, for example, uh, the entire plant is edible of the dandelion and they're extremely prolific. Uh, do not eat them off places that have been sprayed with chemicals. So any wild spot that you think hasn't been treated, that's why we don't treat our lawn at all. And there's all kinds of things that grow up on our grass that are edible. So um, clover is edible. The regular three leaf clover that you have in your yard tastes kind of lemony. Sample things, uh, don't sample, I'm just saying you can test things now. You don't have to make it into your, your meal now, but kind of know what, you know, what things are out there. Acorns are ed edible, but they have to be processed a whole lot. So if it's gonna take you a ton of calories to uh, cut down firewoods that you could boil up acorns, then it's not a good, it's not a good move for you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, acorns have to be processed. They have to be crushed up and then they have to be boiled three or four times until a lot of the tannins come out so that it's not harmful for your liver. Also, they taste terrible until you boil those tannins out. Tannins are very bitter. And then let's see what else. We have grape that grows on our property, so we could eat um, wild grape if we had to. The grape leaves, if you cook them, are edible. Not everyone's taste. Briar. In Texas, there are parts of the briar plant that are edible. The root is edible, and the new shoots right at the top of the shoots are like, I understand they're like green beans, and you can eat them raw or cook them, which is crazy. I thought briar was a completely waste of life. Briar is the one that's extremely thorny and it grows straight up until it gets leaves on it. And it just, every time I'm in the woods, I'm tangled up in it. We have so much briar, it's out of control in our, in our woods that, that we live on right here. And so we have plenty of that. We have goldenberry, which looks like, or ground cherry, I think it's sometimes called. It grows in a leaf package that looks uh, kind of like a tomatillo which is like tomato with, it's, it's related to a tomatillo. And they're really tasty little berries and they grow all over the place. And you just gotta catch it at the right time of year. So we're propagating, we have a little section of our yard that we don't mow and that part grows up golden berries. And that's just kind of neat. Um, I only found that out because my husband bought me a package of exotic golden berry seeds. And <laughs> it was in this package of exotic seeds. And when they grew up, into plants, I looked at it and I said, you know, this looks really familiar. And I, I said, oh, they're all over the ground here. <laughs> Not so exotic after all. But it's interesting what those kind of uh, gifts turn into. But um, I keep looking out my window at the, our different fruit trees and we've added so many fruit trees. Um, I'm just super, super excited to share with you in the springtime, all the different fruit trees that we've added. And I hope that you stick with me and I hope that something that you learned today can be useful. I am, oh, I thought I was out of time. Hang on, there's something else I wanted to talk about. I, I need notes here. Oh, crud. Okay, so, um, But the only thing I didn't mention in my list of artificial intelligence item was what if what if AI is just a child? You know, what if this what if Hermie is just really a child and he's really annoying? And I don't know if you know children, but sometimes they just like to scream for no reason. What if what if this what if Hermie just describes decides to make just super annoying noises in your home? <laughs> just like a high pitched squeal. We went to a we went to a play the other night and there was uh, a scene where the, where the boy uh, kisses the, the main character, the girl, 
and the girls who were sitting behind me were in high school and screaming at the top of their lungs. And I really, like, I really wanted to commit violence at that point. Like I really, I thought I was gonna, I, I, I kept control of my temper, but I was, I was very close to not getting control of my temper with that scream, but AI, ah! Yeah, I'm not good at that. So anyway, well, once, once everything starts blooming outside, I'll get you guys some more videos about the garden and the different um, things that we're working on here. My sauerkraut, uh, oh, I haven't done that video yet. I'm fermenting, I'm learning to ferment different foods. Um, lactobacillus is the uh, bacteria that grows underwater in an in a, in a, um, an environment that's, that's airless. So let me show you something, just a second. Okay. Here is my sauerkraut. So that is a way of preserving vegetables so that they last much longer and it removes the air by, by keeping the vegetables submerged underwater. And so the lactobacillus has the opportunity to break down in the plant and it sends up, the bacteria sends up carbon dioxide. And my house, it smells terrible. <laughs> when you, well, just that, you know, just that section every morning when I push out those carbon dioxide bubbles, some gases are released with it and it smells really like cabbage and <laughs> and cabbage just smells bad. Um, but all those gases are coming out of it and it's it's not bubbling up as much as it was. And so anyway, that's a, that's a way to preserve food. And then you can store your cabbage um, in the refrigerator in a jar for months and months and months, preserving your harvest for longer, which is really cool. And you can do that with all different kinds of vegetables. I also have carrots mixed in there, but that's a, a good thing to know if carrots go on sale and you're going to need to store carrots for a while, you can store them fermented. And that's, it's, it's what originally was called pickling. Now we just kind of, we think it's anything pickled as it's just in salt and vinegar, but this is a, this is a similar process, but this is um, really cool. Well, I guess it's, yeah. I don't know if it's the same thing exactly, but vegetables, all hard vegetables can be preserved with this method of, of keeping them submerged underwater. Some people use rocks to hold them down. And then I got a couple of jugs and I'm learning to make wine. So I've got a big uh, gallon of grape juice wine that is being, uh, that is fermenting right now. And we'll have to give that a try in a couple of weeks. And we already did the sourdough. We already talked about sourdough. That is also lactobacillus. So that's pretty cool. Sourdough bread is say, I can't afford bread or yeast anymore. Well, then I can make my own yeast. That's what sourdough bread is for. And I probably got, did I do that video or not? Yeah, I think I did some video on that already, but I have a bunch of video to edit. I have a couple projects I need to be working on and I've been teaching art classes and so, very, very big. Is anybody still here? Hey, Shanda Glams. Hey. Now this woman, Shanda Glams, makes beautiful bread. Her bread does not look ugly like some of my bread. Some of my breads look awful, especially that sourdough. And Shan, do you do sourdough? I have questions. <laughs> I'm not getting the big air bubbles in my sourdough. And um, so I haven't had great success with it. It tastes great, but I want the big bubbles on, in the sourdough and I just don't know how to keep my starter alive like that. So hugely act, active. If you've got any tips, please let us know. Okay. Sorry, I keep leaning forward because my vision's bad. And I'm, even though it's new contact day, every, every two weeks I get to put in a new pair of contacts. I don't have good enough vision to wear daily wear contacts, but um, it's still a little difficult for me to see the text on the screen. So that's why I lean in. So does anybody uh, have any ideas of how you can produce food for yourself if you have little or no space? Just chime in in the comments and I'll try and think of some other things that you can grow indoors. Cats, you can raise lots of cats. <laughs> cats are delicious. 
Um, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely thinking everybody should get out there. And if you don't have, if you don't have land, get some. If you don't have friends who have land, you know, do their yard work for them in in exchange for in exchange for being able to grow food. Like if you can if you can split a yard with somebody and they get lots of tomatoes and you know maybe you could pay some of the water bill or something if you need to water it. You can you can make it happen. Yeah. So actually, I'm really kind of concerned about the what the cost of food is going to be compared to the cost of income. Okay. Let me check what Shan's response is here. I've gone as far as making the starter, but I haven't made it yet. I have Josie's, Josie Baker's book to get down the process first. Oh man, I just dove in. <laughs> um, the important thing that I found with sourdough starter is that you should start with rye flour, organic rye flour that's unbleached. And that is because yeast is actually present on that flour. But when after flour goes through the bleaching process, it won't create its own yeast. Then you would have to, like you do for normal bread making, use commercial yeast. Uh, humans, earthlings, we've only been using commercial yeast for about 150 years. Before that, all bread was sourdough bread or unleavened bread, which would be flat bread. Ooh. Do you guys watch um, Hum Doug and Stacy's Homestead or something like that? Homestead with Doug and Stacy or something like that. Anyway, those uh, they made some sweet potato mixed with flour, flatbreads. And as you can see, Stacy's so skinny, she doesn't eat much bread. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, that looked like a really good recipe I saw in there. Yes, rye. And I mix white whole wheat too. Hmm. Okay, so I just found an, um, a bag of artisanal bread that's unbleached bread flour, and I just started mixing that in two days ago because I think the bread flour from Costco may be bleached. I believe it. It's I be, I'm going to look when I go into Costco, but I'm starting to think that bread flour has been bleached because I think it's killing my starter. So the more I add back in that... Um, unbleached flour, I think that I should start get, seeing some lift again in my starter. And my starter has a name. It's Hercules. I've heard other people have like uh, Clint Yeastwood. You know, yeast, Clint Yeastwood. That's pretty funny. Uh, but everyone should have a name for their starter because you have to feed and water this thing every day. So you have to treat it like a pet. Okay. Oh, yeah. Send me a few links. That's cool. Thanks, Shan. I can't remember what your real first name is. So, ooh, Arrowhead brand flour. That's a good idea. Okay. I think that might be what I have, but I'm not going to run over there and check right now. Um, oh, here's another thing. In all of the sourdough recipe starters, it says, okay, take half of your sour sourdough starter and throw it away. And after it smells like he Shannon, okay, well, that's good. <laughs> Hi, Shannon. So after um, it's, it smells like yeast inside your flour, if it smells nasty, don't use it. But once it starts smelling like yeast and it says throw away half, I've fig I found out from uh, Brothers Green Eats, another YouTube channel, that you can make savory pancakes with that. So what you do is you take off the half that you're um, – that you're not going to use and you would typically throw away before feeding. And the reason why you do that is because otherwise you'd end up with this massive amount of sourdough starter. So you take off the amount you want to use and pour that into a pan like you would pancakes. Spray your pan, you know, pour it in, throw in a little butter for browning, and then you can chop up chives or what I use is the tops of onions that are growing out in my yard. I always run out and grab a few of those. I grab a little rosemary that's growing in the yard and I grab a little oregano. I chop it up. And you just sprinkle that on the on the surface of your pancakes. And then once the bottom's brown, flip it over and brown the top. And then you dip it in soy sauce. And like I mix soy sauce and Szechuan sauce, but I think he mixed soy sauce and teriyaki for his dip. But it's a savory pancake, so it's not sweet like a regular pancake. This would be um, less glycemic. Isn't that a fancy word for having less sugars in it? 
So you can eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but I had them yesterday for lunch. It's a great way to use that excess starter. So I thought that was a really cool, delicious tip. Maybe we'll have to do a video on it someday and I'll make my own additions to it. Because I think that if you mixed an egg into that and cooked up some of that starter with a little bit of egg, that would taste absolutely out of this world and have plenty of nutrition. So I guess I need to go check and see if the chickens have laid any eggs today. Our chickens are so slow. I just want to squeeze on them and make them poop out those eggs. We have, um, we had to get rid of two of the babies that we got last year because they ended up being roosters. We had, and it was, I mean, that stank because we had Scarlett sitting on those eggs. She finally hatched them. She attacked and killed one of the babies that came out. And then the two, uh, the two survivors ended up being roosters. Wait, did she kill one? Hang on. Yeah. Yeah. One was too far, but one didn't make it at all, but then two of the others didn't hatch. So, so I guess they stopped developing. Uh, but anyway, then we bought four uh, Americanas and they are not yet up to laying age. So we only have three layers right now and we have five freeloaders and four that are too young. So we really need to add to our chicken. Oh. Someone, he also has a documentary on YouTube. Who are we talking about? Brothers Green Eats? I bet he does. He's awesome. And then there's another guy, Brad, who does videos for Bon Appetit called It's Alive. And that's who I learned how to make sauerkraut from. And by the way, when you make sauerkraut, from the time you put it in until it's sauerkraut, I mean, the whole time you can actually be tasting it out of there. It's perfectly safe to eat it, which is cool. And when you're making wine, perfectly safe to take samples as you go. Uh, right now, my wine is fizzy, so I think if I took samples of my wine right now, it would just taste like fizziness, fizzy, fizzy grape juice, safe to drink. So the wine process is interesting, and I hope that goes okay, and I, I hope I can make you a video of with, the re with my recipe for it eventually. But imagine, you know, something happens, and uh, there's no, the trucks aren't moving, Maybe my fruit trees come in and we can't eat all of it and I preserve some as wine. Um, something happens and delivery trucks aren't coming. All those people who need their booze, think about how much they might pay for any form of alcohol at all. <laughs> or if, if there's any sort of disaster where people are suffering and they just kind of, uh, they would be, they would need a glass of wine just to, you know, steady their nerves or something. I could see it as having medicinal uses in a in times of disaster. Not that not that prohibition is going to happen again or anything, but if it did, I now have the materials where I can turn some of the fruit, some of the crops into something intoxicating. So that you know, you never know. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. But I think knowledge is always useful. You know. Um, Part, part of my job here in the family is the, uh, is the one, I'm the one who learns and does research and figures out how we can make this little farm more productive. And my husband brings in the income. And then on the weekends, he works his tail off implementing all the ideas that I've learned during the week. And so I think it's a, it's not fair. <laughs> I think I have the better job, but, uh, but we're really enjoying our time on our little farm. So I am going to sign off now. I think we've, I think we've beaten the robot apocalypse to the, to the death here. And um, thanks everybody for showing up and let me know uh, what you want to see videos on in the future. Okay. Let me see. Amazon has bread baking book called Josie Baker bread. Get baking. Awesome bread. Share the loaves. Josie's also on YouTube. Blessings. <laughs> um, yeah, that looks like a great book. Cool. Yeah, so I don't know if you guys have ever seen this before, but after I got up to the uh, the right level, the right number of sub subscribers, I now have Super Chat. So, you know, next time I'm on here, you can send me $1.
with this little dollar sign. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> Maybe someday I'll have a huge like subscribership and then, you know, I'll be able to, it highlights the comment. It's really cool, but I've never gotten a chance to see uh, that work yet, but okay. So take care y'all. I hope that you have a wonderful weekend coming up, make plans, find a way to make some, some food that will grow and then grow again. Because if you constantly need something from the outside to come in, then you're not producing, you're merely consuming. So find a way to produce, make something that makes babies. Cool. Okay. And this spring we get to take honey from the bees. So that'll be awesome too. So stay tuned, you guys. Okay. Bye, Gilbert. Take care. Uh, now I got to figure out how to disconnect this thing. <laughs> oh my gosh. Seriously? Do you guys remember when my computer messed up? I couldn't figure out what to do. Okay. Bye-bye.